marriage made in hell or a way to feed the world's growing population? On today's Newsmakers, we focus on the multi-billion dollar deal between Bayer and Monsanto to create the world's biggest supplier of seeds and pesticides. Also on today's program, is it helpful to label disabled athletes as inspiring or superhuman? A Paralympic medalist gives us her opinion. And in picture this, what little they had, destroyed by fire. A huge blaze rips through a Greek refugee camp where thousands are living in limbo. Hello and welcome to the Newsmakers with me, Imran Garta. Monsanto is the U.S. company that pioneered the introduction of genetically modified crops more than 20 years ago. In the process, it's developed a reputation among environmentalists as the embodiment of corporate evil. Bayer is a German pharmaceutical and chemicals group that's not quite so vilified, but it has come under pressure for making pesticides implicated in the decline of bee populations. Now Bayer is planning to buy Monsanto for $66 billion to create one of the world's biggest agribusiness conglomerates. Bayer's chief executive says the new company will help to meet one of the greatest challenges of our time, that is, feeding the world's growing population. But Friends of the Earth have called it a marriage made in hell. Our newsmaker today is the Bayer Monsanto deal as we ask what it means for farmers, the environment, and the food that we eat. It's fiercest, critics say. It's the corporate face of evil. When people express fears over corporate control of food and genetically engineered foods, one name invariably comes up, Monsanto. Now, one of the most controversial corporate brands is part of a massive $66 billion merger with German chemical conglomerate Bayer. Bayer's takeover of Monsanto, if approved by regulators, would make the new company the largest agribusiness on the planet, selling 29% of the world's seeds and 24% of its pesticides. But the move follows a rush of agribusiness consolidation in recent months, with ChemChina Syngenta and DuPont Dow Chemical forming their own multi-billion dollar agri-giants. The Bayer-Monsanto deal would leave the world's farmers with a duopoly. Bayer-Monsanto and Dow for seeds, Syngenta and Bayer-Monsanto for chemicals. Bayer CEO Werner Baumann has said that the merger will provide farmers with new technology and better solutions. But critics say reduced competition in the market could actually hamper innovation and lead to slower improvements in crop yields to feed a rapidly growing global population. Genetically modified foods, or GMOs, as a technology is controversial in itself. On one hand, it's hailed as a solution for farmers who face severe conditions like drought and floods. The reality is farmers need tools. They need better seed. They need tools to help manage pests. And the planet's growing. The climate's getting more challenging. And so then the question gets down to what kind of tools do farmers need in order to feed a growing planet? On the other, it's accused of causing cancer, despite the fact that research on the health risks of GMOs is inconclusive. It's important for me to be here because for my children, we're feeding them non-organic food and it has so much pesticides, so much chemicals that it's going to hurt them in the long run. There's no research to say what's going to happen to them. And it's also been associated with a massive die-off of honeybees, an alarming development considering that one-third of human beings' food supply is linked to pollination. While Monsanto has been criticized for its tactics in leading the charge for genetically engineered foods and pesticides, whether the merger with Bayer will mean more GMOs in general is unclear. If the merger pushes up the price of food, then more farmers could be turned away from buying GMO seeds. Supporters of the deal say antitrust policy shouldn't be politicized by anti-GMO activists with ulterior motives. But then again, anything involving Monsanto is difficult to politically sanitize. 
and the company's critics point out that their worries are rooted in the monopolization of the seed market by a GMO giant, one that could soon be supersized. Randolph Nogel, The Newsmakers. Well, joining me now is Professor Alan Felsot, an environmental toxicologist at Washington State University in the U.S. And from Dehradun in India, I'm joined by the environmental activist Vandana Shiva, who is also a leader of the International Forum on Globalization. Thanks, both of you, for joining us. Vandana Shiva, let me start with you first. You, you think that this Bayer-Monsanto merger is a bad idea. Tell me why. Well, individually, they are a bad idea. After all, Bayer is not just a pharmaceutical company that made uh, aspirin. It was part of, part of IG Farben, and it made the gases that killed people in concentration camps during Nazi Germany. It was involved in making the poison gases. Both of them have a history of making war chemicals. Both of them have, have a history of being war criminals. They've been tried. And now the two come together to be even bigger war criminals. That's why we are organizing a tribunal to try Monsanto in middle of October, because they're going beyond the law everywhere. Bayer was sued in Europe. It sued the European government. Monsanto was sued by Indian government. It's countersuing our government. They really think they're above the law. They think they're too big to be regulated. And their merger is basically sending a signal to governments and people of the world, no one can control us. People will control them. Okay, so let's just put we their history... We do not need sure. their poison. Sure, I just want to put their history aside because then we, we could get into a discussion about whether Volkswagen should continue to make cars, right? So let's just put that aside for just a second. Let me ask you, what's your biggest gripe with um, this potential new company? Is it the monopolization and the controlling of the seed market, or is it your, your bigger problem with GMOs in general? Which one is it? My big problem is them trying to claim they have invented seeds and take patents on it and push farmers into destitution. GMO is merely a door through which they enter the world of monopoly and patenting. That is the serious issue. And in India, they are facing court trials because of this issue. GMO is merely a cover-up. The reality is ownership of seed and the pushing of farmers into debt and creating an agrarian crisis wherever they enter. Okay, Alan Falsot, this new company would become the largest agribusiness on the planet, selling 29% of the world's seeds and 24% of its pesticides according to the best available calculations out there. That would be some mo monopoly, right? That can't be a good thing, right? Well, I think uh, many countries, regulators are going to have to determine whether it's monopolistic and thus legal in their particular countries. So right now it's on table, uh, just as the other mergers, uh, such as with uh, Syngenta and Syngenta, uh, DuPont and Dow, are up for review by regulators. So actually nothing's happened yet. If Bayer and Monsanto were to merge, it'd be a very large company. However, I'm not uh, enamored with uh, conspiracy theories. Uh, I can tell you our, my concern as a scientist would be, uh, will other scientists from this merger be shed, thus not have a diversity of scientists working on issues, uh, I would be concerned that it might slow down development, could speed up development. We're just not sure at this point. Um, I think that what's important to remember is that merger or no merger, we're talking about companies that make tools. Uh, these are companies that will not influence commodity markets. Commodity markets are independent uh, of the tools. Alan, Bernie Sanders says, and I quote, the attempted takeover is a threat to all Americans. These mergers boost the profits of huge corporations and leave Americans paying even higher prices. Not only should this merger be blocked, but the Department of Justice should reopen its investigation of Monsanto's monopoly over the seed and chemical market. A lot of people think Bernie Sanders is a reasonable guy. How would you respond to him, Alan? Well, 
as I said, there's not a relationship between the prices par farmers pay for their seeds and the tools and the commodity markets. The commodity markets run independently. Now, if I was a farmer, I might have concern that prices might be elevated uh, if there's less opportunity for diversity of tools. On the other hand, we've seen prices come down as tools have been more mature. So I think it's really important to get the economics straight. Vandana Shiva, this merger will help feed more people more efficiently. That's the stated aim. And that's what the buyer CEO is saying and might help alleviate hunger and poverty. How would you respond to that? Well, first of all, poisons are not food. Secondly, they grow the four commodities that are genetically modified, the corn, the soap, the canola, the soya, the cotton. Only 10% of the corn and soya goes into human food. The rest is going into biofuel and animal feed. In no other sector is the method of production not reflected in the final price. In only in agriculture, because farmers are first manipulated to sell costly inputs, and with these corporations, an attempt to sell patented seed, which is illegal in countries like mine. Then they exploit the farmer by buying cheap commodities, and then they have partnerships with the cargoes of the world to monopolize the trade market. So at every level, the producer is suffering and the investors are gaining, the traders are gaining. Neither Monsanto nor Bayer have a history of food production. They have a history of chemical production. Farmers produce 70% of the food that we eat even today, small farmers. That is FAO data. We need to expand the ex efficient systems that actually give food without destroying the planet, not the inefficient systems that use 10 times more input to then produce a commodity that doesn't go into food. This is good public relations, bad as science, bad as a reality of where we get our food and what is in the food. Mashiva, if there was less coercion and more options for farmers, would you be open to hearing them out? as just one player among many. And the problem is that they refuse to be one player among many. They want their so-called tools to become property rights, shaping ownership of seed. Those are the legal cases being fought between the government of India and Monsanto today. Those are the cases around the safety assessment of a GMO mustard which is a buyer mustard, which was rejected in 2002. But these corporations do not know how to hear a no from governments or regulators or people. Yes, it's one as method. And the method should be assessed in an honest way, both by farmers on socioeconomic grounds, by regulators on grounds of safety, and by competition commissions and antitrust bodies on grounds of competition. Those are all issues being discussed around these companies separately. The merger makes it even more imperative that we bring food democracy back into the picture in place of the totalitarianism of a poison cartel, because that's what they were, that's what they are. Totalitarianism of a poison cartel. Alan, are you convinced by any of that? Uh, what a wonderful uh, phrase. And if I was a poet, I might use it in a, a book. But here, here's the reality. First of all, uh, I'm going to speak for the United States because I'm a citizen of this country and um, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a few years older than uh, Ms. Shiva, so I've been around and I've seen the history. You might, you might seeds, you might seeds, be seeds are, so seeds have always been proprietary in the United States long, long before uh, the name GMO was invented. So uh, farmers have always paid a premium for these high quality seeds. We used to have a more of a diversity of companies, so true, there has been monopolization. But in the United States, where a lot of GMO-type crops are grown, um, I don't think that our farmers, who are a very independent lot, um, actually feel, <laughs> feel exploited. Now, uh, they're, they're very much um, exploited, if anything, uh, or moved around by, by the commodity market. So when commodity market price of corn was very high, 
uh, in the 2007, 2008 time frame, a lot more farmers started planting more corn over soybean. They benefited by that, but now corn prices are down. They're using the same tools. Uh, the prices have probably come down for these tools, and now they're suffering more. But this is completely independent of what seed they're buying, who they're buying it from, or anything like that. The important thing is that they have a diversity of genetic backgrounds that match their particular environment. So any seed producer, no matter who they are, unless they're producing this diversity that's going to be good for the farmers, uh, they're not going to buy it. Now, to the case that uh, somehow Monsanto is controlling everything, this is complete BS because they had genetically modified wheat for Roundup resistance ready to roll out. And the wheat farmers in the United States said, no way. <laughs> We're worried about our markets. And what did Monsanto do? They took it off the okay. market. So, so let's, get a, you know, let's get a response from Vandana Shiva. Monsanto sure. is, that, you know, is, is that powerful. I think okay. the people, Monsanto's not that po powerful, Vandana Shiva. I have talked to American farmers. And when they started to use GMO seeds, they said, the companies have a noose around our neck. We grow what they give us. Today, as those crops are failing, they're not smart tools and the price is not coming down, our calculations show $10 billion of royalty extraction from American farmers for corn and soya, 95% of which is under Monsanto's control. If that's not a monopoly, what is? Farmers are getting so disillusioned because of the corn borer, because of super weeds. The Roundup Ready isn't working. The BT crops aren't working. 17% 17 drop. And seed companies that had been brushed aside as inferior for bringing non-GM seeds, they are the ones that are helping farmers out today. This is not a miracle. And it is not the case that the prices of the seed have come down or the prices of chemical inputs have come down. They have increased. There's a recent study out from one of your universities that shows that herbivores has shot up as a result of the okay. failed Roundup Ready crops. Failed. OK, Alan Felsot and Vandana Shiva, it's been a pleasure talking to both of you. Thank you for allowing me to pick both of your brains. And I hope to speak to you again in the not too distant future. Thanks so much. Bye bye. Coming up next on the Newsmakers, why some disability activists are pushing back against the so-called superhuman feats of Paralympic athletes. And in picture this, frustration boils over at a Greek refugee camp as a fight breaks out, leading to devastating fire. From Usain Bolt to Simone Biles to Ellie Simmons and Daniel Diaz, the Paralympics closing ceremony on Sunday brought an end to several weeks of outstanding and many would say inspirational sporting achievements in Rio. But how helpful is the inspirational label, particularly when it is applied to Paralympians? The Rio Games have drawn attention to the ongoing debates among disability activists, as Natalie Pohanan reports. Athletes performing at their peak can turn sport into an awe-inspiring experience. In the pursuit of glory, there is triumph and heartbreak. It is inspirational. It draws crowds. But are the successes and failures of Paralympians viewed in the same way as their Olympic counterparts? Or have they been elevated to superhuman status because they are disabled? Disability activists use the term inspiration porn to describe objectifying disabled people for the sake of the non-disabled, singling them out because of their bodies. Stella Young, who coined the phrase, said it's there so that people can look at the disabled and think, well, it could be worse. I could be that person. Some Paralympians want to be recognised purely for their sporting achievements, after all, they've dedicated years of training to reach an elite level, and that should be what sets them apart. It doesn't mean that Paralympians are less inspirational or motivational than other sportsmen and women. But does it mean we need to shift how Paralympians are portrayed so that we are inspired by their sporting ability and not their disability?
Natalie Pohonen, The Newsmakers. Well, joining me now from Cambridge in the UK is Elizabeth Wright. She won three swimming medals for Australia at the Paralympic Games in 1996 and 2000 and is now a motivational speaker and author. Thanks so much for joining us, Elizabeth. Great to talk to you. So a lot of able-bodied people would have watched these Paralympics and seen these yeah. remarkable feats of so many of these people, felt inspired, felt inspired enough to share on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook and so on and say, hey, I'm inspired by this, this is amazing. At what point is that okay? And at, at what point does that then become what Stella Young coined inspiration porn? Uh, yeah, I think uh, essentially there can be a bit of a fine line uh, between it because so often, uh, you know, I face it every day. People say to me, oh, you're so inspirational because you can drive a car or I can get dressed and, and stuff like that. When really, uh, when it comes to the Paralympics, uh, Paralympians should be inspirational because of their sporting feats, just like the Olympians are. Uh, kind of, you know, in the segment that you played just beforehand, they were speaking about, uh, you know, Paralympians put in just as much hard work as the Olympians. And it's that that we really should be lauded on and not necessarily just in going about our every day-to-day -day lives just as everyone else does. Mm -hmm. Help me understand the psychoanalysis here then. Uh, perhaps is it a, a correct analogy to, to bring about the analogy of say rich kids who go and volunteer in, in poor countries and it's not so much about the work that they actually do in the poor countries but it's more about how they make themselves feel. Is, is a lot of this feedback from people for themselves to make them to make themselves feel better about themselves rather than the actual achievements of, of the athletes? Uh, I think there certainly is an element of that. It's it's kind of seen as oh uh, you, you know you're not just overcoming that um, I guess mindset and psychological side of things to to push past and really become an elite athlete and the best in your sport. It's kind of seeing that well you're also overcoming your physical disability when uh, for the actual athlete it might not necessarily be anything to do with the disability. It's it's actually all about the sport and that kind of psychological side of of having breakthroughs in your mm -hmm. sport, doing personal bests and breaking world records and winning medals and making the Paralympics and all that. You know, it's it's kind of hard because for a lot of people with disabilities, uh, and I guess I speak from personal experience, I don't necessarily see myself as disabled because I'm so used to the way that my body is that for me it's absolutely normal. Um, and sometimes that can be hard to explain to people. Yeah, some of these slogans from the Paralympics we're the superhumans or we are the superhumans and there's no such mm -hmm. thing as can't. Is that positive or, or negative in your opinion? I, I think it's positive. I, I will admit to you, I, I love the whole superhuman ad that came out and you know, I thought that was absolutely uh, brilliant. And I think there are definitely a lot of positives that come out of uh, all of the marketing. But I think we just have to question some of the time as to what this marketing is actually saying to people on a more broader scale. I think in terms of the Paralympians, it's fine. But when you have people turning around and, and saying, well, if the Paralympians can do it and they have a disability, why can't all people mm -hmm. with disabilities become Paralympians or do these amazing things and I think people forget that not all able-bodied people want to become Olympians or right. have the ability or capability to become Olympians and it's the same with disabled people. Yeah that's a very good point. I was scooping up some of the journalism at the end of uh, you know the Paralympics and, and some of the best writing that sort of wrapped it all up and I came across an article in the yeah. Telegraph by Gareth uh, Davies uh, written in, in Rio and it was a really good piece but the headline said once again, the Paralympic spirit has captivated us all. And so I, I just wonder, when you read something like that, do you think, oh God, here's another mm -hmm. sort of headline infantilizing or, or fetishizing <laughs> us? Or do you think, oh yeah, that's, that sounds reasonable? Uh, I, guess, I guess in a sense, I, I would say that it sounds quite reasonable in the sense that I think there is a similar feel about the Olympics with that as well. I think the Olympics, people understand that there can be a certain, I guess, feeling or um, inspirational kind of 
emotion that can come from that as well. I just think, you, you know, when it kind of comes to the idea of, of I guess, looking at other disabled people and, and thinking that they're inspirational just for simply making a cup of tea, mm -hmm. um, just as everyone else can make a cup of tea, that's where it kind of creates problems. So I think as long as it stays within the realm of the Paralympics, it's fine. But I don't think you can really generalise it to the wider disability population. Elizabeth, this has uh, been really thought provoking. Thanks so much for joining us, Elizabeth Wright. In today's picture, this a refugee camp in Greece has been devastated by fire. There have been no reports of injuries, but the incident highlights the desperate plight of thousands of refugees living in limbo in Greece. Let's take a look. Today's newsmaker was the $66 billion deal between Monsanto and Bayer. If passed by regulators, it will create a global power in the world of agriculture by bringing together Monsanto's GM seed business with Bayer's strength in pesticides and chemicals. Environmental activist Vandana Shiva says the deal will create a poison cartel which will benefit investors at the expense of farmers. But scientist Alan Felsot told us that the power of Monsanto has been overstated and that farmers are beholden to commodity markets rather than the big seed producers. You've been watching this edition of the Newsmakers with me, Imran Garda. Thank you for watching. Bye-bye.